Welcome to Senior Living Marketing Perspectives. I'm Debbie Howard, co-founder of Senior Living Smart. And today I welcome Nate O'Keefe from Rubric. Welcome, Nate. <laughs> How are you? Hey, Debbie, so, so good to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good. I was thinking back today about when when we first met, and it must have been, I want to say, seven or eight years ago um, at a Aging 2.0 event. Uh, Aging 2.0 used to have chapters, and there was a Boston chapter and kind of a mm-hmm. pitch event that was hosted and sponsored by Benchmark. And um, we were both there, and I sat through all the pitches, and at the end of the night, it was like, this was the one that resonated, <laughs> and we kind of sought you out afterwards and said, what you're doing is so cool, and we really want to know more. So. That, that um, exactly matches my recollection. I think we were in the basement of um, Benchmark's uh, Cleveland Circle, I think Chestnut Hill at Cleveland Circle, and um, and they were hosting this Aging 2.0 event, and it was a pitch session, and so we were... It was six years ago, um, maybe even this month. I think it was almost oh, exactly funny. six years ago. And I'll say for my part, um, it's been exciting to, to um, watch you and, senior, and Andrea at Senior Living Smart um, uh, grow since then and still say, say uh, so true to your original mission of um, helping the independents kind of play like the big guys. And, and that's really um it's a lot of folks go through pivots along the way and and they're all, we all have little pivots but when the, the initial mission stays intact and is so visible it's it's been great to see yes you as well so i i remember being just really impressed with your passion for helping families make informed decisions and doing it away in a way that was uh, private and respectful and also connecting them to help. So for those who are not familiar with Rubric, can you kind of give us um, a, you know, a basic overview? Yeah, absolutely. And, and before we, we get into that, I do want to say um, how humbling it's been to be working in service to the to the senior care industry over the past two months in particular. Um, you know, we're a technology company. We sit in front of computers all day long. I've, I've been able for the past two months to be working out of my house and fortunate to be so. And um, I would say interacting with our, our clients and partners in senior living uh, over the past two months has really deepened uh, our appreciation of what it means to be on the front lines. And, and I'd say our direct contacts in sales and marketing are, are more on the front lines than ever before. They're ordering PPE. They're interacting with families and residents directly. Uh, more often pitching in around around the clock on operations issues, um, you know, all while trying to figure out how sales and marketing has changed and, and will change in the future in a really unprecedented environment. You know, we always like to say that senior living sales and marketing is one of the most complex challenges there is. And, and now that complex uh, complexity is is ramped up substantially. You already had a hard job and now you can't show your product you can't give someone a time frame for when they can buy it uh, or exactly what that resident experience is going to be like. And so I do, I mean, I think every conversation now naturally has the context of what the last two months have meant. And um, while well, I'm excited to talk about rubric and, and how I think we're, uh, we can be helpful and useful. I want to make sure that we're, you know, um, we're all kind of keeping our eyes on this is a really crazy time and, um, it's it's changed changed our thinking a lot just in the last couple of months. Yeah, great point. You, Thanks for bringing that up. And just to put into context, where we're recording this beginning of May, first week of May, and so we're kind of in this transitional period where we've gone through our crisis communication and are kind of hunkering down. And now state by state, we're trying to figure out about the new reality. So th- thanks for uh, the format. <laughs> This is going to be one of those time capsules of, oh, my gosh, what were we thinking back in May of 2020? Oh, my God. Hopefully, right. it will be a, a testament to some accurate thinking and, and um, um, progressive thinking. But who knows? It's always uh, uh, interesting to look at that, look back and see how right or wrong you were. So thank you for giving us a hopefully uh, prescient uh, yes. <laughs> uh, time capsule to look at. Yeah. <laughs> um, so. Uh, I'll kind of I'll share some basics about about rubric and I'll, I'll try and do it in the context of why we think it's especially important today uh, as as the the game has changed at least in the immediate future and will likely be shifting uh, in the in the midterm as well. 
Um, so basically, Rubric is a, um, a survey or decision tool that helps older adults and families get unstuck. Um, kind of foundationally, we knew there are many people who would benefit from senior living, many more people who would benefit than are currently taking advantage of it. And this is pre-COVID. This is like just in general. Um, so it is an underutilized option, um, an under-optimized option for so many people. And further, we know that there's so many people that are actively reaching, uh, researching it, um, so many more that are actively researching it than are actually reaching out and talking to providers. And I think by your estimates, you're saying, you know, you, you've reported in the past that 90% of a, a typical provider's traffic com coming through their digital ecosystem is not engaging. So you've got this really active need and this really active research base, and the funnel just gets so narrow after that. Um, and so what we said, if, if those two things are true, how can we help people get unstuck and, and move forward? How can we activate that audience that's right on the cusp? How can we help them understand their needs, um, their options, and importantly, earn their trust? Um, the answer for us was decision science. You know, we developed a series of uh, decision science-based assessments that catch people on the cusp. Uh, of making a decision and help them move forward in, in an informed way, you know, empower them to say, this isn't crazy, maybe it makes sense, maybe we should check this out. Um, the trust element comes from transparency and, and neutrality. We're not trying to directly market senior living to you or convince you that that's your only choice. We're simply saying that if you or everybody better understands their needs and what senior living offers, more of you will get unstuck and make that choice sooner. It's very much a rising, a, a rising tides raise all ships philosophy that I think so many of us have. Um, those that don't move forward will still have a trusted and helpful experience that will uh, perhaps pay off in the future. But and this is something you helped us understand very early on, Debbie. This is everything that a great sales advisor, a true helper already does, but it just does it one step early in the process and around the clock when families are, are researching at, at two in the morning. I think when, when I saw you at Benchmark six years ago in that basement, I don't think we were as, we had developed as um, complete an understanding of both uh, that consumer audience and disposition and, um, and, and how we can be, you know, how we can be most helpful within provider ecosystems. And, um, mm -hmm. And we, we've, I think we've come a long way with both data and experience to um, to really kind of sharpen that edge. Um, yeah, that's a great I overview. I, just, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah, we'll we'll get more into the specifics, but you know, for us, we're always looking for um, how do we make this journey experiential, right? So uh, the the prospect has changed. Um, and they want to remain anonymous as long as possible. <laughs> they want to be able to gather um, as much information independently of a sales interaction for as long as possible. Um, and I think, you know, that's why we were so uh, impressed with this tool is because the tool is really designed, like if you had to, you know, be at the 50 yard line and say, are you more serving the, you know, the senior living operator, provider, lead gen, you know, side of it, or are you more serving the families? You know, you've always been more on the serving the families and allowing people to remain anonymous. They don't have to share their results. They can still get all of the resources, the care fit report that matches them to maybe their their best solutions based on how they um, answered a series of questions. Um, but the intent is really to do right by the consumer. And so it builds a great deal of trust. It allows people that interactive experience. So you know, that's yeah. that's certainly something I appreciate. Well, that, I appreciate that as well. I, I, I um, that's a phrase we've uh, the phrase we've been uh, thinking about a lot more lately is is earn trust. And we've always talked about trust, and we've we've always, as you as you noted, um, tried to design the experience to to reflect that um, because we know that many people come to this research and these decisions with. Um, a lot of misconceptions and preconceptions that are uh, amplified in today's environment. I mean, I think the, um, and so if you're dealing with a skeptical audience and trying to build comfort that, hey, here, here's what we really are and here's what we really do, 
Um, trust is that currency. And trust is especially that currency when um, people do want to be anonymous for as long as possible. And so that's, we, you know, we, we think of ourselves as um, uh, being, wanting to be the right stewards so that your story as a provider of, um, you know, when, when you walk into a community, you can feel that trust in the people you meet and, and in the, you know, the, the vibe is in, is in the air. It's so, mm-hmm. it's so much harder to do that with words and pictures on a website. And it's harder to do that if you can't get that, get to that experience of a great conversation with the sales, sales advisor or that in-person experience. So we said, what's, what's the proxy for that? And, um, and I th- we think we're an important part of that equation. Video, I think, is as important as ever. Chat, mm-hmm. um, you know, c- content still of, of all forms is still so yes. relevant and important. Um, we just we we think we're an important uh, spoke on that hub, and and, I, and the data has borne that out. Yes, you know, I would agree. You know, people spend so much money just driving people to the website, but a lot of times when they get to the website, there's absolutely nothing for them to do. It's an online okay. brochure hasn't been updated in years, uses stock photography. And so, you know, you've got your paid campaigns, you've got all kinds of things. And, you you know, you finally get that person with that high intent because nobody searches for senior living for fun. And they have that intent. You drive Mm -hmm. them to your website, you know, you get that, you get them there. Yeah, yeah. But you still have, they've got to take an action. And, and, you know, another currency, trust is absolutely a currency. And the other one is the transaction is, the exchange of something value, valuable for contact information. Yes. yes. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. you know, yep. hopefully people have guides and, you know, infographics and great blogs and you know, people are chatting and we're giving people different channels. Um, mm-hmm. But I think, uh, you know, with rubric that, you know, people are trying to figure out where am I, how serious is the situation? What are my options? Um, in a way that's um, without the sales pitch <laughs> and, and in a mm-hmm. way that's mm-hmm. more more self-discovery based. So can you give people a sense of the, the type of, of information um, and data points that you're trying to collect within this yeah, decision sure. science? Yeah, and I, I was so, so the way we characterize it is we think it's equally important to um, kind of gather what I would call relevant, and we would use the word diagnostic, but information that will be helpful to the um, community to understand if, if, if they can be helpful, if they can be a fit. And the other half of that is, is an experience that engages and builds trust among that, the prospect or the family member that's looking. And so it is designed to, very deliberately to be a conversational assessment that's, you know, every time we create a new rubric experience or assessment or survey, it's, it's we try and get back into that. What's the mindset of someone before they knew um, what they wanted or how to talk about it? It's usually a cycling set of observations and fears. And that fear is often around safety or it's often around engagement. You know, I'm, I'm afraid there's going to be a car accident or I'm afraid, you know, there's a, we've got a memory loss concern that's going to, it's going to uh, es- escalate. And so by acknowledging and providing an outlet for that fear very early on in the assessment series. So we start with, well, first of all, who are you concerned about? And you can choose yourself. You can choose a number of family members. Typically, we see about 30 to 35% of people will actually do be get doing a self-assessment. It'll be an older adult um, mm-hmm. curious about their own their own journey. Um, and and so that first question is just, you know, how, int- introduce yourself. You don't have to give us any personal information. You can say, I'm not going to tell you right now. Um, and then the conversation is, well, you know, where, where are you today? Are you home with other people? Are you living by yourself? Uh, mm-hmm. Are you still driving? Is that a, and is that concern you or not? Is it something that's one of your issues? Um, and then that kind of opens the door to um, just ask some more exploratory questions or this balance of, again, information that, you as a provider will be able to quickly help that person with and, and information that keeps them engaged and keeps them talking about their concerns as well as allay some of those, those concerns. Um, it's not a, I think one of the reasons we don't, we don't personally use the word survey so much in our, in our marketing is that we think of sur- mm-hmm. surveys are typically about taking, it's about taking information and assessment yeah. is about, um, about, 
get kind of more giving back. It's, it's an experience that um, as you're answering the questions, you're better understanding your situation because there's context around them. And mm-hmm. then the results are very comprehensive as well. And I think, I think that is important. There does, yeah. if, if someone is, most of us understand when we give our data now, um, it is because we want to get something, whether that's free access to a television program or um, to a platform like Facebook. Uh, for us, mm-hmm. it's if you're gonna if you want to share your information, we're gonna use that information to um, tell you something about yourself and your situation that empowers you to think more clearly or get unstuck around that. Right, and and they can choose to share it or not. And if they want to keep it private, they still get those results. And you know, those results kind of look like a report. It kind of turns all that data into a story. I took it from my mom, so it would come through as you know, I'm worried about my mom, and she's 87 and living home alone. And these are the you know, these this is the situation, yeah. and um, you know, it's some information about um, you know. Uh, how comfortable they are with their financial preparation, um, yeah. you know, their willingness to make a change, which is always a key question. Um, and so at the end, the the prospect really gets this wonderful synopsis and kind of uh, all, there's almost like a recommendations engine based on how they've answered the yeah. questions yeah. to yeah. say, oh, yeah. sounds like, yeah. you know, these lifestyles might be the best fit. Exactly. It is. While there are soft aspects to it, there are also very, very practical aspects, both from um, what we do is we kind of synthesize your responses into a level of care recommendation, and then we'll correlate that to settings where that those care needs can be met. Um, so there is a, and that and that tends to to map pretty well to what our clients see when um, a family kind of shows up and gets an in-person assessment. Is it, it tends to map pretty well what someone self-reports and the way our algorithm processes that data um, tends to correspond to. Mm-hmm. the care level that ends up being the right fit. Um, so there's, there is a, when we create these assessments, we have a clinic or a, an occupational therapist on our team and the clinical review board. So it's not, it's, it is about, um, about providing some kind of curated validated experience as well. Um, and, and that's important. I think that's, you know, it, it it's allowed us to, um, use these tools with groups like AARP and Us Against Alzheimer's and the NIA. And mm-hmm. um, it's not, you know, we've, we see some broad applicability and, and utility there. Yeah, I would say having experienced, you know, the sales from the community side, um, you know, as well, it, that I find that the the results and the comprehensiveness of the rubric care fit report really better than most of the inquiry forms that <laughs> that I've read through or information in the CRM. I think families are more truthful because a lot of times when they're calling or doing a phone inquiry, they tend to err on minimizing things, um, yeah. partially out of the fear that they'll somehow be disqualified. Like if I tell you that mom has wandered or yeah. <laughs> you know something yeah. has happened. Yeah. But in a in yeah. a self-assessment where I can remain anonymous, you know, I can really, you know, be be authentic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. to some degree. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate that. that and, and I, I, oh, go ahead, Nate. I was going to say that that's so important and that's, that's by design. And some of that we think about is just making the questions easy to answer. And I don't mean necessarily mean easy from, well, it's, it's one, one of the things we think a lot about is the economy of guilt, uh, particularly for family members making a, de- a decision. And, um, if there are questions that are really specific, like how many times a week do you, does this happen? Which is a typical kind of clinical assessment. Um, those create anxiety because if you don't know, you feel like, um, maybe I haven't been paying attention or I don't want to get this wrong. I don't want to overestimate or underestimate. So we ask questions in a way that you can sort of infer what the likely, um, level of, of severity or interest or concern. Um, might be, and everyone, at most all questions have an "I'm not sure" answer. So if somebody is really put mm-hmm. off by it, they can click that and keep going, uh, or they have trouble answering that. Uh, and so a lot of it is meant to kind of empower folks that no, you you shouldn't be an expert on any of this. This is a brand new world. You can only kind of see what you see and and process that the way you process that. So let's let's just make it kind of easy for you to have a conversation, and um, we'll we'll kind of tease out how we can then best help you from that. And that's that's sort of the art of the of the assessment design of the pedagogical design of the experience 
not just what do we want to know. It's how do you how do you want to to get at it. Um, and that, that is that's I think that's made a huge difference in the success and level of engagement we've been able to to demonstrate with this tool. Mm-hmm. And so you have data now for you know several years over hundreds of communities. So as you look at you know that data. What can you tell us about the prospect, about the prospect journey, and maybe what senior living operators can learn uh, from the data that these folks are, are giving us? And, and are, yeah. what are they trying to tell us, Nate? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so, so much of it goes back to that original thesis that there are a lot of people out there that are, as you said, they're on your website. You got them there. You paid to get them there uh, yeah. who are who who need something more to move forward. They need to feel empowered. They need to feel informed. And so that mm-hmm. that data came early and very consistently um, with in, in just in, in terms of the performance. And so uh, when we talk about what we, you know, what we can do for a provider today, we, we pretty much guarantee that you will see 20 to 40% more uh, online leads than you're getting today just by adding the rubric call to action to your website and in various places within mm-hmm. your, your ecosystem. Simply by offering this service or this tool to your providers, you're gonna see that boost. And that's repeatable um, and, and it's been very consistent. Some some people are higher than that. Sometimes mm-hmm. they're a little bit lower and we work with our providers to optimize and say what's different between what you're doing and other people are doing. You help us with that, Debbie, when it's yeah. you know a partner that we're, we're, um, we're, we're jointly um, collaborating on. Yeah. Um, but for that, to get that validation that, yes, this audience is there and they do need a unique experience that they're not getting in other forms um, mm-hmm. was very, very important and um, and interesting to us. Um, so that overall, that that's I mean, that's that's kind of our our key takeaway. When you start to look at demographics, some of the I think I've alluded to this earlier, but. Um, there's all there's always been a perception that, and this is not across the board. I think other various people think about it differently, but a perception that um, older adults themselves, prospects themselves, are less interested in um, in, in digital engagement or in kind of mm-hmm. going going th- doing the same things we all want, but they have a different set of needs or desires or capabilities. That has changed so much in the last six years, Debbie. And um, yeah. you know, there's been many great studies that have showed that. No, you know, we've got a lot of people coming to our platform that are 95 plus are yeah. on tablets, are on desktops. And so that's just been a nice story and one that I think it's been great to see that the technology has been accessible and it's being used. Um, for us, the unique twist on that is that um, older adults and prospects are willing and interested to click on a link that says, is it time to get help? It's not, doesn't, mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be all lifestyle marketing. Um, you you don't necessarily have to dance around around that in the same way that um, well I think it just expands that conversation and how independent living um, and even assisted living can be marketed that mm-hmm. um, it doesn't all have to be lifestyle and not to say everybody's doing that but um, we still work with prospects are you know in the industry that um, are initially reluctant to say well should we put this into our ecosystem. And, um, we often say, well, let's let's try it out because others have been in your seat and tried it out, and we're really interested in the data and the response. Let's get that mm-hmm. same data for you. We also developed specific tools for a little bit earlier in the funnel. Instead of is it time to get help, is it the right time for senior living? That touches on you know what what sort of support might be available, or might I want or need, but is more focused on that prospect audience. So we've you know we've adapted our platform as well. Uh, and that's just been it's been that's been a really interesting insight. Um, and what that means is that when we gather our data and aggr- aggregate and, and present it and synthesize it, that you know 30 to 40 percent of that is data from future residents. Um, yeah, which, which is an interesting data set. Yeah, that really is interesting. And have you seen any kind of a shift in the in the world of the last two months of of COVID? You know, we keep get hearing these reports about lead lead generation in general being down by 50%. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, but uh, so are you, number one, are you seeing the, the also a related decrease in the number of surveys? And then also yeah. maybe how does it relate to um, intent? So of the people taking yeah. the surveys, are you finding the scores are higher or the, the we're yeah. getting more need driven and more acute kind of situations? Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. And, and as a kind of a preamble to sort of take it full circle, um, you know, our product has always been about uh, helping people overcome uncertainty and inertia. Um, when we think about COVID-19, we see the same dynamics, but we think we see that, that the causes for that uncertainty and inertia are absolutely different today, like May 8th or whatever it is today, May 9th. Um, <laughs> And, and they'll be different in a in a phase where restrictions are lifted, and they'll be they'll be different beyond that, even when um, when COVID is is managed in a in a more effective way. This has been this this will be a game changer in the way people think about it. Mm -hmm. um, and and so as I mentioned, we see that trust equation shifting as well, and we see it as our job to help our clients in senior living understand how it's changing. And react either in the data we share or the products mm -hmm. that we develop. Um, so it's been really important to us to figure out how can we help. And you know, we back in March, we can't source PPE, we can't source COVID tests, mm -hmm. um, we can't boost resident engagement or provide a video tour or family communications. So what can we do that is additive and not noise? And so we talked to as many people as we could. I talked to you last month. Yeah. Um, to understand concerns, anxieties, predictions, um, and we came away with a really clear need, and that need was data. You know, what the heck is going on out there? What's going to happen? Right. What's everyone else doing? Um, yeah. You know, give me data and context that helps me do my job uh, and stay sane. That reduces my personal uncertainty as the captain of my ship. Right. Um, so we did. We did two things. We started producing um, COVID impact reports, the latest of which we're rolling out today. And I will answer your original question and share some of that. Mm -hmm. um, we also started putting together these kind of off the record peer discussion groups. You know, our clients want to be talking to each other. And I know you see the same thing. Yes. You, you probably got a call from everyone in the business saying, hey, what's going to happen? What are you seeing? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, that comparing notes and that supporting each other, the response to that has been great. Um, so the report that we released today um, looks at March and April. It pulls in aggregate anonymous data from across the rubric platform and is national across service levels. So we, we've been doing some uh, client-specific reports as well, but this is kind mm -hmm. of the aggregate report, so you can kind of get a sense uh, at large. And the first thing we saw and want to acknowledge was the, the decline in volume. It can't sure. be sugar-coated. Yeah. Um, we saw a 44% decrease in users to our platform. You've seen this elsewhere. The, the Enquirer report that came out yesterday reported 41%. Mm -hmm. In general, we're seeing 40, a 40 to 50% decrease in inquiries. And I'll just a ask you if that's within the range or would you add to that in any way? No, that's spot on. That's exactly what, what we're hearing across the board. But what's interesting is we're also hearing that because there's less volume, um, and because sales directors are less distracted with, you know, other aspects of their job, that they're finding that they're having more meaningful interactions, yes, longer yes. conversations, and actually um, better conversions. Yeah, that one, well, that's, that's exactly right. And so, um, of course, we're all in sales and marketing, so it is in our nature to be op optimists and look, look for that optimism. But I, I think we also tend to do that with some pragmatism and realism. And we don't want to sugarcoat a story that's not there, but what we are, we're seeing the same thing. And uh, I think one interesting way to look at a, you know, 40 to 50% decline is you still got 50 to 60% of people that despite every opportunity and excuse to stay away are still coming, you know, they're distracted, they can't, they know they can't come in for a tour. Um, there's tons of negative press. Despite all that, they are still coming mm -hmm. to your website and they are engaging with you in a deep way. Though the need remains, and I think there's reasonable speculation that it may be elevated or presented in a new light. And so the way we saw that in our platform was a much higher rate of engagement. So volume was, in debt was down, but the number of people going through that were choosing to share their results and talk to a provider, uh, mm -hmm. the, the rate for that increased 20% uh, within that period. Yeah. So, um, 
the people that are coming are, are there. And I think that it sounds like you're seeing the same thing on even further downstream when, mm-hmm. uh, when the outreach happens and when those conversations happen. Yeah, definitely. Um, the people who are still, you know, initiating, you know, these conversations, they have, they have higher intent. There's a little bit more um, urgency. And I, you know, I think there's a couple things that are contributing to that. Number one is that a lot of the support system that might have helped someone um, remain home a little bit longer than maybe even they should have, you know, yeah, like senior yeah. centers and adult days, you know, they've closed. They, they kind of had the luxury of saying, okay, we're, we're closing. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, right. you know, senior living doesn't close. We're here. We show up. We take care of people. Um, and so some of those folks that might have looked, you know, more independent and more self-sufficient, um, once you remove those, um, those kind of support systems, all of a sudden mm-hmm. it looks different. The, the, there's yeah, more yeah, isolation. Yeah. Um, you know, all of a sudden there's more dependency on on services that maybe the older adults are not comfortable. You know, my mom got a call from her doctor saying, hey, click here for a, uh, you know, telehealth. Well, if you're 87 yeah. and never heard of telehealth in your life and your doctor's saying this is the new way we're going to, you know, be mm-hmm. having these conversations, it's, it's traumatic. Yeah. You know, if you're in a senior yeah. living community, yeah. someone's going to help you set up that telehealth conversation. That's right. That's right. You, you know, yeah. you're. So I, I do think I do think that the people who are coming in now um, have maybe noticed uh, changes that might have been camouflaged yeah. by other systems. Right. That makes sense. That, yeah, that, that we, we the phrase we use is a, a sentinel event. What is the thing that gets you unstuck and moving, or gets you even gets you the research phase? And every for every year and day up until you know march 13th or whatever it was a driving Mm -hmm. concern or a fall concern or a diagnosis um, or a memory concern and um, those things are all still relevant but but we you know what we see is what you just said that i think the lockdown experience and the vulnerability of of you know the audience that we serve has been that sentinel event and it's kind of forced folks to look at is my current living situation sustainable um, in this sort of environment? And if not, what, you know, would I have been, would I have been better off? Um, I think, I mean, I think to, to be frank, what's going to be really important for the industry is to, to, to help build trust is to, to get some, to get some data on, well, how did we do? Were we successful? Mm-hmm. Um, did we, were we a, a um, a more secure and productive environment during this phase. And to be frank about that, I mean, because there will be, yeah. there, all, there will be examples of positives and, and examples of negatives. And I think just frankly understanding, um, you know, and then, and, and telling that story will be important. And I'd say among our provider base, we've had quite low incidents. We know not everybody has been so fortunate, but few right. cases we've got some quite large providers that as, as late as recently as two weeks ago had zero cases. Mm -hmm. Um, because of the processes that were in place and because of um, where they were geographically. Uh, But I think really taking a hard look at that and, um, and, and presenting a, you know, a, a, a frank case about, yeah, we, we, we think we're relevant and we think we're important and we're, we're doing the right things. And here's the evidence we have that shows that or or what we're doing in the future to make that even more secure. So are you adding any COVID specific questions just to kind of gauge, yeah. um, you know, the, the yeah. impact or the influence? Uh, we, we, so it's funny, back in March, one of our first instincts was, well, let's grab the bull by the horns and recommend some questions. It's on our minds, so it must be on everybody's minds. And I think initially yeah. in, in that period, there was still some legitimate provider uncertainty that, well, we think it's important, but if it's not, top of mind do we address it within the rubric experience or do we you know keep our banner at the top of our page and our additional content and that has that balance has shifted in the last six weeks or so and we have um now there's much greater interest in addressing it directly not just in rubric but you see great examples of i think i want to talk to you a couple weeks ago well, you all have been very proactive with your clients in providing content and mm-hmm. uh, encouraging um, wide promotion of it if, it if it matches their brand and demographic. Um, 
And, and we've seen the same thing. Webinars that communities are hosting, they're very, very kind of frank and maybe clinically oriented around here's what we're doing and what we're here to answer your questions. Yeah. Um, so we are, we have um, over the last month fielded a few different test questions in our, in our kind of test environment with, um, with some different kind of market research pools. And we all, we, in, Mar in May, we will be offering and recommending that those questions be added again, if, if they're fit for, for mm -hmm. what you're trying to do. And I think they should, they will be and should for most. So one was, um, and this is in the report that we're releasing today, one was essentially how do you think this is going to impact your decision process? And um, they, the options were um, it might delay it, um, we, we actually think it might make us make a decision sooner, um, mm -hmm. no impact, or we're not sure. And um, we've done this now at two different periods. Early April, a shocking 48% said uh, it was not going to delay their decision process. Uh, so about 27% said that it would, um, which, which is understandable. About 5% yeah. said it would accelerate. Um, so. We asked that again at the end of the month, and and again, these are not these are a couple hundred samples. So this is, this is not the be all end all, but we did see kind of consistent from you know the first few users up to 200, 250, um, consistent response patterns. It shifted a little bit. Uh, about 42% now are um, are say there will be no impact, and and 38% are saying I think it will delay my decision. I, mm -hmm. We think that's going to be an interesting one to track over time, just from a market research perspective. But to your question, I think it's an important and, and a safe question for our clients to be asking within the context of Rubric. And you could even make the case that to not address it in a dialogue like what Rubric creates um, might be a, a tonal misstep, that it's, yes. it's relevant. It's not going to scare anybody away. Um, you're already talking about it on your website. Let's ask about it. Yeah, and I think ultimately the goal is that, you know, for the people who choose to share their report, um, that this is going to equip the sales team at the community level to be able to have a more personal interaction. So if you know that, you know, somebody has answered a question that way and said, it's, you know, it's going to be a delay for me. I'm just not comfortable. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a very different interaction than someone yeah. who says it's going to accelerate or I don't think it's going to impact at all. So I, I do think. You know, that that's one of the major advantages that I see, you know, when I get rubric reports, because we have basically all of our clients we do business with. We recommend, um, you know, rubric as part of the strategy it just makes a whole lot of sense. And so I get those reports and I look at them and, um, you know, it's it's very compelling to see, you know, that people are saying, Here's every I'm willing to share all of this information about me and tell you that this is not going to affect yeah. my, you know, my decision making. Yeah. I want to get on yeah. that and I want to have a very different conversation. I'm going to have to be, you know, gentle, you know, slower. Yeah. I'm going to have to watch my cadence is going to be different for people who say this is going to delay. And I've got to understand the, the root cause of that. I've got to spend a lot. You know, it's just different. Yeah. Um, and do yeah. you find, have you been able to break down the data to say that like the majority of people who may have more of a willingness, you know, even in today's circumstances to move forward, are more of them answering questions like um, I'm at home alone versus I'm at home with mm -hmm. help or I'm at home with family? Or have you seen any kind of correlation um, or maybe it's around mm -hmm. uh, the acuity? Um, I'd love to know mm -hmm. if you have any insights on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, and with with 23 um, kind of data points or questions that are asked per assessment, on average of that, um, there are so many cuts of the data that that we can do, and and we've and so some of those some of those that you requested that you mentioned are in process. Some of the ones that we've mm -hmm. done just in the last uh, you know week or so have been around a, a notable demographic shift. Uh, over the past two months, and so we looked at March and April data and saw that. I'm going to glance over at my other screen over here because that's where the, mm -hmm. the um, report is. But uh, we saw a um, the the makeup of people saying they were assessing for themselves, who were prospects themselves, was six and a half percent higher than tip than is typical over the past two months. So more prospects looking for themselves, which in and of itself okay. was interesting. And uh, I was really excited to see that the uh, Enquirer reports saw the same thing. They saw an uptick in, in IL searches, um, 
we, you know, we wanted to look a little bit deeper at that. So we, a little bit more deeply at that. So we also saw, um, you mentioned that um, when someone goes through the assessment, it gives them kind of a rough care level assessment. And that's minimal, low, moderate, elevated, or around the clock. And mm -hmm. typically when you see an uptick in people saying, uh, in, in self-assessors and prospects, you get more minimal and low, right? Because they either have lower care needs or they're under answering some of the questions. It's a very typical pattern. Yeah. Um, what we saw in, in March and April was we actually saw a decrease in minimal and low, and we saw an increase in, uh, mm. in moderate and elevated. And so we took that a step further and said, well, if we just isolate to those prospects, are we seeing the same thing? And we saw exactly that. We saw that prospects themselves, 10% more, are uh, the, the percentage falling into a moderate or elevated bucket is 10% higher than typical, which um, was really fascinating. And so the way we kind of back of envelope interpreted that was um, maybe people that weren't previously looking are now looking. So people that are mm -hmm. higher acuity that were saying, I'm, I'm okay in my current situation. I've got support. I can go to the grocery store, get deliveries, um, are now saying, gosh, I, you know, I've been able to age in place to a certain level, but I do, I'm aware of my care needs. Mm -hmm. And they're now coming and saying, gosh, maybe I need to consider a, a change. And the other is that maybe that audience that was coming before is now being a little bit more frank in their assessment because it's been brought front and center. Um, I think that is potentially a really important learning right now as, p as we think about our messaging and engagement with this audience, mm -hmm. uh, that at, at very least consider that you may have a higher percentage of prospects coming in a different mindset. And, um, and if, if, if you're talking to them, you're probably going to elicit that in your conversation with them. If you're mm -hmm. not, what can you be doing in chat on your website and content and the webinars to acknowledge that, there is a new, there is a potentially new audience or audiences thinking very differently and optimistically about what you may be able to offer them. Uh, have mm -hmm. you, do you, do you see anything that, that uh, might support or, or contradict that, um, you know, or that would, would um, speak to that? So we're finding that um, the independent living is having, you know, much less of an impact Overall, um, mm -hmm. they're not seeing a whole lot with, uh, you know, lead generation fall offs or um, a lot of the other concern. It seems to be hitting um, assisted living and memory care much more so. Um, but we even see, you know, in the paid search, it's still incredibly um, competitive out there, you know, to get those mm -hmm. keywords and to do that ranking. So, yeah, you know. Yeah there's still enough traffic and there's still enough intent that's yeah, driving yeah. up, you know, the cost per lead. Um, so, yeah, but I would say yeah. overall independent living seems to be having, you know, far less of an impact, I would say. And I know yeah, you also yeah. have a question about kind of people's mindset around change. Are you finding that fewer people are taking the assessment right now? Um, but, are, are they in a different mindset? Are more of them answering the question to say that they have more of an openness to change? Or has there yeah. been any impact with that intent? We, we are seeing that, and that's reflected in that, in that higher um, willingness to, to move forward and talk to someone as well, that there is a greater mm -hmm. open-mindedness about that. One of the COVID-specific yeah. questions that we've recently fielded and will, and will also be offering and encouraging is a kind of a barrier question. And this is not meant to be COVID specific, but it does, it is meant mm -hmm. to tap into that. So it's essentially, um, you know, this can be a tough decision. What do you, what would you say are the kind of the main obstacles to, for you, for you right now and acknowledging that, yeah, this is, this is not easy for anybody. And so it's normal to have some concerns and the top choice is still, I just, I'm not sure if this is the right choice for me, which is perennial. Mm -hmm. That's always been a concern. The second yeah. is, um, I really want to better understand what life and senior living is like. The third is, um, is it the right time to do something? Um, the fourth is, does this make financial sense? So these are all, these have not changed. Um, people still mm -hmm. want to feel informed and confident to make the choice. The distant number fifth was, um, I'm concerned about COVID as, as an impact to making the decision overall which kind of tells us that the fundamentals still matter, that yeah. uncertainty and inertia are still the, the things that are keeping people from reaching out and talking to you. How do you earn that trust? How do you 
answer those questions for them, help them understand what life in senior living is like, even if they can't come in for a tour, um, mm-hmm. help them think through timing. And, and we, we, you know, we're a part of that equation for sure. Um, so that's, it's, it's, it's really interesting to us to see both what has changed, but also what has remained the same. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, good stuff. And I know we've talked mostly about kind of how to leverage, um, you know, rubric, um, you know, uh, as a tool on the website, but, you know, we're beginning to experiment with um, with some of our clients in creating paid campaigns where, you know, taking the rubric test, you know, wondering if it's, if senior living's right for you as a call to action, mm-hmm. or is it time to get help? Yeah. Click here and find out. Um, so, and I know we're figuring out things around, you know, Google um, code on the landing page to make sure because we want to track everything. We want to put people sure, into sure. lead nurturing with HubSpot and it has to be part of a, of a yeah. overall strategy. Um, but, mm-hmm. you know, what are the uses, um, you know, as people get used yeah. to this, this new technology that you've kind of introduced us to, yeah. how are they also leveraging it through other channels? Yeah, yeah. Um, the One of the very broad questions we always ask is where are, um, where are people coming to you, how are they coming to you, and what's the likelihood that in that channel they're going to be as uncertain as anyone else? And so um, on the website, that's an obvious one. When we think about website placements, um, it's uh, it's often on, it's, it's always on community pages. Uh, we always mm-hmm. recommend the home page of promoting our provider. If, if there's a corporate home page, many of our partners see about 25% of their volume coming through that, and that will reflect in, in many ways, that reflects what's happening in your ecosystem anyway. We're catching people that are in each of your channels that aren't going to move forward or having trouble moving forward without an experience like Rubrik. And so uh, we have a, use of a broad set of recommendations around placements on the web and language, and we work with you to you know, customize, customize those so, so they match your brand and experience. Um, nurturing, and I know um, you all are, are kind of a leader in HubSpot, uh, implementations and, and autom- marketing automation. It makes tons of sense there, both as a call to action for messages. So um, if you're sending out regular content, it can include links to the rubric assessment. They can then co- go back and make that HubSpot record, you know, five times richer because you now have all this data that can also integrate with CRM. Yeah. You can also use that data uh, to inform your HubSpot profiling. So if someone mentions a driving concern and you've got content around driving safety, you now know that that's going to be relevant to that, that person. So it's the, the data story is so interesting and in that intelligence that you're getting from someone that's chosen to share it with you, who's given you a license to ask those questions and to provide that content, uh, so important. And so many of our providers are seeing success in pay channels as well. So whether that's a call to action specifically that drives to rubric or just um, driving pay traffic to pages that prominently offer rubric, uh, where we've seen such a broad range of uh, ideas and tactics there that we're, you know, working now in kind of a co- cohesive, um, this is, these are our top recommendations. Um, that, that said, you know, it's, there's still the challenge of, um, are you bringing the right audience to begin with? If, 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 you, if the right audience isn't coming, then they're not going to interact with Rubrik any more than anyone else will. It's not, it's not going to take a mistargeted um, visitor and turn them into a senior living resident, just as any other tactic wouldn't. Um, but um, it's so, so there are a number of ways it can be used within that channel as well. And, and just generally, if, even if you're not doing marketing automation, email marketing, um, mm-hmm. We've got folks that are using us in exit intent. So if someone's about to bounce and, you know, they're still in research mode, you've given them the opportunity to say, well, hey, do this free anonymous survey, and maybe you'll, you'll choose to move forward. Um, so mm-hmm. it's, it's pretty versatile, and we as a team support, as you know, um, making sure that that implementation is not something you need to struggle through, but it's teed up for your agency, your in-house team, to uh, make that as easy uh, and trackable as possible. So we can then say, well, here's your ROI after a week or after three weeks or and here's right. how that every time. Yeah. No, that's great. We, we've we had good experience, as you said, um, with lead scoring. You know, we are able to weight certain behaviors and, you know, someone who's willing to 
answer 23 questions and spend four or five minutes, you know, doing that certainly, you know, in a lead scoring situation is uh, is assigned more points than somebody who might just download mm -hmm. yep, a brochure, yep. for example. And then for lead nurturing um, and, and even re-engagement, we're seeing um, really good results there. So, um, so Nate, if people want to get a hold on, of you or they want to learn more about Rubric, um, how would they do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, we, of course, we have our own website at, at rubric.com. Of course, um, we, we've we been working with you for a long time. So if you don't mind a, an extra phone call or two or email, Debbie, you can mm -hmm. reach out to Debbie and she can uh, she can help out. Um, yeah. My email is really simple, nate at rubric.com. And um, we can chat. I can connect you with our team that actually would, you know, would be the, the folks you'd work with through a um, discovery process and then an implementation process. So, um Yep, come come Great. come find us, and we're happy to tell the story and and see if it makes sense for you all. Yeah, no, that's great. And you know, we always tell everybody it's all about strategy. You know, think there's lots of tools out there, but unless you have an overarching strategy about you know how to use them and kind of the, your setup with your goals and alignment with you know your um, marketing priorities, um, you know that's where things really start making a difference. And so we certainly always have uh, rubric as a as a recommended best practice for all of our clients. And um, if you want to get the show notes, if you want to get hold of the impact, the uh, COVID-19 um, impact study for a couple months worth of data, okay. it'll be in the show notes as well as uh, Nate's contact information. And of course, you can always reach out to Senior Living Smart. So Nate, thank you for sharing your senior living marketing perspectives today. Yeah. Yeah, th th thank you so much, Debbie. I hope you have a um, a, a good weekend and, and May month ahead. And 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 same to everyone out there on the front lines. We know it's uh, every day is a new set of challenges and opportunities, and and uh, we wish it, we're wishing everyone the best. Thanks so much, Nate. We'll see you soon. Okay. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. We'll see you soon. Okay, bye bye. Thank you.